Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's show is with lead singer, founder, drummer, songwriter of the band Night Ranger, Kelly Keggy. Kelly talks about how the band got its start in San Francisco, got their record deal, lost their record deal, got their record deal back, uh, toured the world with some of the greatest bands of the 80s and 90s. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Once again, Kelly Keggy, lead singer, writer of the band Night Ranger. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame. Today's guest is Night Ranger founder, drummer, lead singer, writer, Kelly Kagi. Hi, Joe. How are you? It's been uh, about five years, I think. Since that seems longer than that. I've been, you toured the world with our... Yeah, with little, little Buddy. Little Buddy. Uh, <laughs> Kelly took Little Buddy with him all over the world. They took pictures of it. I know we went, we went like to Japan, then we went from Japan over to Europe, and we toured with Journey and foreigner over there that, that spring and, and uh, yeah every chance I got I, um, I took a picture with either fans or people that you know that I would just meet you know and, and it was like they were like what is this <laughs> you know but then it would be like click click yeah. oh too late see ya yeah. you know? well now that was when a lot of people used to take little stuffed monkeys or something with them and, and show them sitting on a Fence or a yeah. stadium, wherever they were playing at back then, or whenever y'all were doing that. But anyway, uh, yeah. So Tucker called me. Tucker Williams, Tuck, yes, and uh, my good friend. Yeah, great, great guy. Uh, I don't know how anybody that doesn't. You can't know him and not like him. <laughs> but anyway, he told me you were coming to town and going to swing by the museum. So we thought, well, why not? Let's do this. You know. So. Yeah, it was great. I mean, of course, you know, many years ago he. He wanted me to be the the ambassador, you know, since I was going on a world tour to yeah. spread the word and do interviews. Oh, for the museum. And so, yeah. so it really worked out, you know, um, that you accepted that. Because, you know, uh, I mean, it's, uh, you didn't really know me at that time, about 10 years ago, I think. Yeah, it's been a long time. And it was like, oh, yeah, I know the song. Yeah. But um, we got to know each other quick, and, and uh, it was really great. And thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. To, because this is such a great uh, place, and everybody in the world should come and visit and know it. So I hope that you know it's been happening, but it seems like it has been it's, since it's going this, well. You know the the uh, video and stuff like that on YouTube, and, yeah. and so it's great. I'm glad it's working out. Yeah, well, too. You know, just like everybody, when we got slapped, you know, pretty hard with you know when COVID came through, yeah. but it's all come back and and better than before, and so it's it's, it's all good. So. So, um, let's just start, like, with, um, you're from San Francisco, right? Well, the band got together in San Francisco, but I was originally from Los Angeles. And then in high school, I moved out of state just for the last year of high school, and then moved to the Bay Area, where I met, you know, Jack and Brad. Uh, and, you know, we were in, like, two other bands before Night Ranger, mm -hmm. playing around the Bay Area, so... Um, you know, but, but the long history that I was for, there for probably 22 years, and then I ended up moving to the Midwest. I moved here. I was here for 15 years, and now I'm in Arizona mm -hmm. now, but um, it's the last few years. Man. What got you into music? What got you wanting to be a, a drummer? Or did you start out to be a drummer? Or? I did. Um, kind of did both, played guitar, but um, I always, you know, was a singer. So it was. I was kind of like j jogging back and forth between drums and singing and in high school, junior high school and high school, and, uh, and played guitar some in there, so I wrote songs that way. And um, But ma my main instrument was, a, was the drums and lead vocals. I always say I was a singer before I was a drummer, you mm -hmm. know. And, you know, it's all, you always need a drummer or a bass player. Those guys are always like, you know, kind of loosey-goosey sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, you know, um, you know, being being a lead vocalist and a drummer was kind of interesting. There wasn't too many of us around, you know. So, but uh, Jack and Jack Blades and myself kind of we started the band Night Ranger, mm -hmm. and um, 
the band before that that we were in was called Rubicon, and they had a singing drummer in the band. So that was kind of where I really started my professional career. Then you know. Well, how did how did you? Okay, so you put the band together. Mm -hmm. You started playing around San Francisco. Yep, small clubs. <clears throat> how did you get your record deal? You know, we would we would uh, we would do showcases for record companies and try and you know it's every six months or so you could there's a a place in every record company if you send the tapes and they you know you get to know people there you can get slots and they'll come see you at you know play live or whatever and a lot of times our showcases were in L.A. so we'd have to go down there and drive down there so we did a lot of that traveling up and down from San Francisco to L.A. and doing you know, opening slots for whoever, you know, and um, and then finally we got somebody, it wasn't a record company, but it was a producer mm. that that um, basically signed us to a production deal, Greenlight Productions, Pat Glasser. He had produced, uh, you know, some bands in uh, the 20th Century Fox record, record label mm. and uh, came out to see us. Everybody passed on us because our show was just was it was a disaster. Everything technically went wrong, could have gone, you know, did. And and so but Pat happened to be in the show and uh yeah, at the show and he he um of course knew Jack and Brad from Rubicon because mm -hmm. they were on twentieth century label. So what we did is we started a long relationship of trying to find the right songs and us, you know, over the course of like two or three years we had the right songs, and then Boardwalk Records uh, heard our demo and um, signed us to a record deal in 1981. So n now I'm not familiar with Boardwalk, but so were they distributed by a major, a big? Uh, they were distributed by um, I want to say Polygram, so, okay. but um, they did have a yeah, it was like Poly Polygram and it was two labels, Polygram, Poly. Some, it was a German label mm -hmm. that was uh, distributed. Them. So, um, but it was, it was right at kind of like right at the end. They had Joan Jett. Joan Jett was riding on I Love Rock and Roll. And she sold like five million records of that first record at that time, and we got signed. And um, so it was like we were, you know, we were pretty lucky. But you know, the guy that. Um, that, that liked us and signed us to the label had to take it to the president who was in the hospital at the time. Yes, it was Neil Bogart who owned board, Boardwalk Records and he had Donna Summer. He signed Donna Summer. He signed Kiss uh, later on because it went from Boardwalk Records to Casablanca Records. And so they got Kiss, Donna Summers, and then our guy came in, Bruce Bird, and was the vice president, the, the youngest vice president of any record company at the time. He was like 25 or something. And uh, he, when, when Neil was sick in the, in, the, in the hospital with cancer, that's when he brought the tapes to him. And he heard some of our early demos and was like, don't tell, don't tell me it wasn't on there. Sister Christian wasn't on there. They were just rock tracks. But it, I guess, you know, we played good enough on them, and he thought we were good enough to sign. So Once he signed us, you know, he took, he took the demos to the, to the president of the record company, CEO, and, um, and he said, yeah, I like this band. You know, he took some other demos, cassettes, by the way, at that time, you know, and um, he said, I like this band, you know, uh, what do you think? And he said, yeah, I was thinking, you know, Bruce Bird was was actually the uh, the vice president of Boardwalk Records. Mm -hmm. And um, and so he said, yeah, I like this band and you know, want to sign them and whatever. And, you know, and and then um, the president died. He died in the hospital and. And so there was this whole big hold on everybody that was going to get signed, and you know, and so we were waiting for six months, and and it was we thought it was kind of like the end because mm -hmm. you know we've been waiting already for a couple of years, but we just hung in there, we kept writing songs, we kept getting better, 
uh, at that, you know, and playing. And, and uh, you know, in 1982, we went in the studio and started recording the first album. Yeah. In a sad way, that might have been a, a good thing for you, though, if, if it, because it did give you time to hone your writing skills and... Line everything up mm -hmm. right and, you know, come up with a name, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. I How'd mean, you come up with that name? You know, it, it was like one of those goofy things where we threw a bunch of names in a hat and we picked uh, the name. It was, it was actually originally uh, called Ranger. And, um, but there was a band that was from the South here called the Rangers already had the name. And so when we went to release the album, the first album, Dawn Patrol, we had that name, you know, Ranger. And, and I guess it was something like they did some sort of search and Billboard put out, you know, 20 music, uh, uh, 20 years of country music, <laughs> the Rangers, you know, and we were like, oh no. Yeah. And they had already printed up 10,000 copies of the, of the first uh, albums yeah. to send out the radio and stuff. And we were like, Oh my God, we're in, we're in serious sh right? <laughs> um, excuse my language, but, but it was like, so all these, there's, there's somewhere out there, there's these, there's, somebody's got to have a copy, because we never got them, but somebody's got to have a copy of, you know, like, Ranger, you know, Dawn Patrol, you know. So um, what happened is we already had a song on the album called Night Ranger, so that was just lucky. So we called everybody and said, well, you know, here's what we can do. We could put a knight at the top of it and just stick it on there. And, and uh, that'll be the name, Night Ranger. And we were all like, yeah, that sounds good. And we hung, hung up the phone. And we said, this is the worst name <laughs> on the planet. This has got to be the worst name. So we were just scrambling. But that's, that's how we ended up with Night Ranger. But it worked out It was out just well, by we tripped over mm -hmm. everything. And it, it landed right, you know. Well, yeah, it did. So, um, now what was your first, the, the first big hit you had with? First single was, um, d um, off of Dawn Patrol, was uh, Don't Tell Me You Love Me. Yeah. So that was a rock song, went to radio. Uh, the second song was Sing Me Away, um, was, a, was right, right um, before Boardwalk had gotten in trouble with the IRS. So we were out there touring with Sammy Hagar and, uh, and uh, just, you know, d did like three months with him. And we came back home and the record label had gone, uh, the IRS had just came and just put chains and locked up the door and said, that's it, you know. You owe us too much money, you're no longer in business. So Boardwalk was out. And so we were in San Francisco playing, you know, um, two sold out shows with Sammy Hagar at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. And there were no, song, no songs, no, no records, no nothing in the record stores, no nothing. Songs were being played, but, but there weren't any, any place for anybody to buy the, the records, so we were, we were sunk, so. Did you, did you get your royalties that you should have gotten? Or? You know, what happened with us, we were guaranteed, when we found another deal, Bruce Bird went and found another deal at MCA Records, and at the time, um, um, there was a new president that just moved in there, Irving Azoff took yeah. over for MCA in LA. And um, so Bruce Bird went and made a deal and somehow they get, you know, because he could bring, you know, the, the uh, proof that we had sold over half a million records on that, on that first record. So they said, well, we'll guarantee it. So we were like, oh man, because we thought that was going to be the end. Yeah. You know, it's like, who's going to pick us up when there's all this turmoil in the mm -hmm. middle of, you know, oh yeah, your record, you know, your record contract is over there locked up in the, you know. You so were lucky, man. It was amazing yeah. that they... They just moved our deal over to them. So who wrote uh, Don't Tell Me You Love Me? Jack Blades. Now that's the lead singer? The, I mean, the lead, the, the lead, lead, bass player, player, lead singer. Player. Um, him and I wrote a, a bunch of songs together along with Brad Gillis. He was good, man. He, or, He's great. Is, is he still with you? Or? He's still with us, yeah. Um, how, the, many the, how many members, our original members, are still? The, 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 the three of us that started the band, Brad, Brad Gillis, Jack Blades, and myself, 
um, are still together. That's so we great. started the band, and we were in uh, two other bands before. Mm -hmm. And then w when it became Night Ranger, we got Jeff Watson and we got Alan Fitzgerald in the band. And um, we continued on, uh, continued on, and made like uh, five, you know, uh, great records and had some amazing success. And just uh, and then we took a break, and then we had some other members in. But the three of us have always been. Uh, in the this core, thing for forty there. years. Wow, you know. that's great. I know it's amazing. <clears throat> so, uh, Sister Christian, you wrote that. I did. Or, or you co-wrote it, right? Or you wrote I wrote it. it. You wrote it by yourself. I wrote the uh, lyrics and melody to that song. Well, that's a, that was a good look for you, wasn't it? That was a that was a stroke of luck. But yeah, that, I, I I you know I I brought that one to the band, and in the beginning I didn't even have the title. You know, I just had. I used Sister Christian as the the verse, the first verse, and it ended up the chorus was motoring, and so Sister yeah, Christian like and two, two yeah great hooks in one I song. Know. You know? I know, it ended up being just perfect um, and just simple enough to be a sing along, great chorus. Did you so. have a lot of people call it motoring instead of Sister Christian? They did. They did. They were like, yeah, you know, that motoring song, you know. And it was like, yeah, Sister Christian. Some, some people knew it, some people didn't. Well, but when, when uh, back when we opened up our Grammy gallery here in the museum in 2015, I think it was, and you were here and, and introduced you to Garth. I met Garth then for the first time. And he, what did he say to you then? I mean, I, you know, you introduced me to, you were very nice to, you know, like pull him over and say, hey, this is Kelly Kagan from Night Ranger. And he wrote that song, Sister Christian. And he, and he went, he went, Sister Christian? I mean, just like that. And I was like, I was standing there like, I think he's kidding, right? You know? And he's like, oh man, I can remember back in the day, you know, driving 90 miles an hour on the freeway with the, the windows down going, motor it. And I was still looking at him like, waiting for him to go, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, man, that's you? And I was like, oh my God, he knows this song. Oh, he's a, he's a big like, rock fan. I mean, he, you know. <laughs> He, oh yeah, I, I mean it was amazing. Like I was and telling you, he incorporates, you know, he, every, like he grew up, you know, we're the, that generation that grew up listening to anything, you know, yeah. whether it was Kiss or, or Night Ranger or, or, or George I mean, Jones, he remembers you know? everything. I mean, you know, it's yeah. like we would, you know, during that meeting we talked about, you know, some of those early influences like that, mm -hmm. and oh my God, I mean, I, I would, I would say stuff from the fifties, and he'd go, oh yeah, and he'd start singing Blue Moon or, yeah. you know, or whatever it was, you know, yeah. well, that we were talking about it. He just was a sponge at that yeah, time to, right. for songs and melodies and mm -hmm. lyrics, you know. So I mean, that's that makes so much sense, you know. So. You, you um, you're about to head out to where are you where are you heading? On? Yeah, we're gonna uh, go into Oklahoma City to play out there. Um, you know, we've just been starting, uh, you know, the tour, but then uh, next week we're going to Europe. We're gonna play uh, Sweden Rocks, the big festival, right? Um, you know, they've been having it. It got canceled a couple of times, of course, during COVID. Oh, yeah. But they're re they're uh, they just uh, since. Uh, since the the first uh, outing for that, so they're um, it's it's amazing. It was Guns, Guns and Roses. Every all the the lineup is still still kept in from two years ago. So um, yeah, so we're gonna play with Guns and we're gonna play with a bunch of European acts. We're gonna be on the on the bill. Of Ten CC is yeah. gonna be on oh, the bill. Yeah. They're playing like two lines before us. So I'm I can't wait to. Hear them play, you know. I'm, I'm not in love. Yeah, well, yeah I was reading how they did that. I mean, it's great so, stuff. so much stacking and just vocals, oh. you know, just incredible. I mean, before Roy, Roy Thomas Baker and Queen did all that stacking, they yeah. had had done that, and I thought, and that stuff still sounds fresh. Yeah, the writer, uh, one of the guys in Ten CC, Graham Goldwyn. Yeah, he wrote some of my favorite songs back in the '60s, the Yardbirds, uh, "For Your Love," and and, oh my God! Uh, bus stop and yeah, he, for the Hollies, yeah, right? right? Yeah, and, I know. I, I was reading about him, you know, uh, because he did have hits outside of, of his band TCC, Ten CC, <laughs> and it was like, it was like, man, great, great songwriter. I mean, you know, that that's pretty amazing. That's that, that's uh, incredible that if you can get hits outside of 
you it's know, like a good friend of mine. Sixties and eighties and yeah, and it's, it's a good friend of mine, uh, um, Jim Peter. You, uh, yeah, I know Jim. That you yeah, know, yeah. You know, and he's had that success with Thirty Eight Special, and, and he did. He had Eyes of March with a vehicle. Yeah, yeah he had, vehicle. Uh, uh, Eye of the Tiger. For Thirty Eight Special, he wrote songs for you know Hold On Loosely. He wrote uh, you know a big song for them and. Good, good writer, man. Oh, really yeah. good writer. Yeah, he was a good singer, good guitar player. And, Great, man. Yeah. All around amazing. And he still he plays does. Plays everything, yeah. too. If you go and write with him, he'll sit at the piano and just start playing, and then he'll pick up the bass. And, you know, and we'll do a track, and in, in a half an hour, you got a demo that sounds great, and he's playing well, all he's, the instruments. He's just with, totally enthusiastic, like a like a 18-year-old. You know, he's just, he's, he got loves Got great it. purple hair now. Big purple hair, amazing. man, yeah. <laughs> One thing I was going to ask you about, you know, you you got to live, you're living the rock star dream. I mean, and... <laughs> Made it through. Well, yeah, you lived, and you lived. <laughs> I lived through it. <laughs> but for people that, you know, always wanted to know, what, what was it, what was, what's it like? What was it like in the beginning? What's it like now? Yeah. Um, is it what you dreamed it would be? Is it, and... and uh, um, just, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I didn't that? have any uh, preconceived notions about what it was going to be like to be in the in the business of music, and and uh, had no idea what touring was all about. And luckily, that we had a lot of pros come in and lead us by the hand through it. But you know, and and it happened so fast. And I'm sure everybody says that. You know, it's like because if something takes off in radio, and 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 really does take off, you're just trying to keep up. You know, because it's like, oh, we need you, in, you know, in L.A., we need you in New York. And that's what you do. You just bounce back and forth doing radio shows and promoting it. And then if, a t if, if you happen to get on a tour, then that's when you lose track of all time because you're just on a bus, in a hotel, on a, you know, in a plane, on a train, or in, inside venues like this one. And, and it's just, it's just, it just rolls like that for weeks and weeks and weeks. You know, some of the tours were 18 months, you know, and never and only had, you know, a few weeks of break. So, you know, when you're out there and, and then when it's over, that's when you realize, oh, this is this is what you do. This is how you promote a record. This is what success is like. And if you're lucky, you know, you can your your brain is able to remember it and some of the great things and some of the weird things and some of the fun things, you know. And if you're able to keep that, keep it, keep it going, and not get too absorbed in it, you know, um, then you're very lucky, you know. Uh, one thing that I noticed when I was um, producing Hank Williams Jr.'s band back in the '80s, and and I went on the road with them a little bit just to, you know, see what kind of audience they had, and trying to figure out what songs we needed to record, and right. And, it, and Hank at the time was like being, it was like, he was like a rock star. I mean, it was it, the 20,000 plus, you know, people. And, Amazing. Um, but one thing that struck me, and I just wonder if it's the same thing for you, was um, you've got all day after yeah. a while. You know, it's, and pretty soon the hotels are the same. Getting trouble. The, the food's the same. <laughs> and you got two hours you look forward to about every night, and then... And it's crazy. I mean, the the crowd screaming. I mean, that many people. You know. Oh yeah. It's it's a frightening a little bit at first. You know, it, uh, when that many people focused at where you're at, hollering at you. That's right. They're here listening to every note, and it, you're on the spot. You know. Yeah, and it's just it's it's overwhelming, and and uh, you just and then when it's over, it's like this incredible rush, and then it's. And then it's like. So how, Silent. Did, it was up. Did you experience that? I oh mean. my goodness, it's uh, it's gut wrenching too. Because I mean, if you don't find something to do during all that time, you know, a lot of a lot of it's spent traveling too. So you try to rest as much as possible. But you know, you're the kind of you know you're keyed up. You know, you you're anticipating the next next show, and so you know, I mean, it's like you you're just killing time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, some people can write music. Maybe you'll get a, t a tune, <laughs> you know, or, or an idea out of it. But a lot of times you're just caught up in the moving, you know, and you're just, 
you know, planes and trains, you know, and, and the whole thing, and sound checks, you know, and all that. So a lot of times, you know, you're just, you're just burning up brain cells, you know. So you wrote, did you write Sister Christian before you guys popped, or? We I, did, yeah. Okay. I, I brought it to the band when we, when we were, you know, before we did any demos. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at the time, we wanted to be a rock band, so uh, focusing on ballads was, was something we didn't w really want to do. You know, we wanted to have, you know, an energized record, and we wanted to write as many up-tempo songs as possible. So that song was written, but it was kind of per, put on the back burner mm -hmm. and saved because we did have more than enough for the first one and about a half of, the, of a second. So we had tunes left over, so we put that in there. We didn't, you know, it's like back then you really don't know what you have because you just, you know, you're basically putting songs out there hoping, hoping that somebody is going to, you know, grab it. Did and the radio stations flip it or, make it or start playing it or did the record label choose it? You know, the rec record label would definitely choose. I mean, you, you definitely have your, you know, you know, your input, but it's, it gets all down to the staff at a record company, you know, what they believe in and what they're going to put their energy behind. So it was Don't Tell Me to Love Me and Sing Me Away were the first singles, you know. So, you, like, you know, it's funny. I mean, I've always heard that ballads were star makers, you know, for really. I mean, it, it's true. And you look at Foreigner, all the great stuff they did, but oh. I want to know what love is, dwarfed everything. Oh, know? absolutely. I, I agree with that. Because I think that um, a lot of times it's the melody and lyrics that come through in a ballad that will touch hearts, minds. And well, a ballad really doesn't really matter if it's country or, or, it's true. or rock or middle of the road, whatever it is. It, it, it's just according to what the production is, pretty much what category it gets put played on. I agree. Uh, you know, so it is about the lyric and melody. And, mm -hmm. and most of the executives at record companies, they always say, they, well, at least the one that, that was in, influenced me the most, he was at Capitol Records, and he said, the melody is the first thing they hear. If they can't make out the lyrics after the second time, it's still that melody mm -hmm. that they're that they're grabbing onto. So I always thought that's going to be my first thing when I go to write something, is the melody's got to be so recognizable yeah. to me. Yeah. You know, so that's, that's how I work, you know. Well, how many records, how many songs, and how many times do people sing the wrong lyrics even, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I had, I had a friend of mine, uh, my, of my daughter's little brother was going around singing, I want to rock and roll all night and part of every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty clever, actually. Yeah. That Not could be time, better. Just part of every day. <laughs> part of every day. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> what what band did you like? Like you've, I mean, you've toured with so many groups. Yeah. I mean, um, what's your favorite group to tour with, or was there one? Well, we um, us being from the Bay Area, we did play with Journey a lot, and mm -hmm. so and they have so many great songs. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so they were one that, that we really enjoyed playing with. Um, and of course, uh, back in the day, we did ZZ Top when they uh, uh, came out with Eliminator. Yeah. And well, they, so they came out yeah. with, and they were playing theaters and then they jumped to Coliseums and we got on that yeah. on our second record. And um, so that was a really fun tour. We did three months with them. And, and uh, Billy Gibbons is a hoot, man. He's a, yeah, I know he's a real he, character. He helped us. Uh, he played with when we inducted Will Lee. Oh, nice. And, oh, God. And so, he act, get, so he jammed, oh, yeah, jammed he, in the he, band. He, and, he, yeah, he, he and, Will, and Will played together and it, for the award show. And, and he, of course, he's great, you know, I mean, uh, both of them. But, I mean, Billy is, um, he's, you know, he'll never, you know, he can play as long as he wants to because he'll never change. But, uh, Appearance, you know, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's, oh man, and his feel like he, you could, you could play, he could play anything. Yeah. It doesn't have to be just rock and roll, oh, no, blues, no, no. I mean, everything, but. Uh, so Journey, you got to play with them. Uh, yeah. Was there another band or another? Um, yeah, you know, we've done, we've done a lot of shows with Foreigner. We did, we did a, a, a whole tour with them. When, now, um, when you, when you were touring with them, they had the, 
Yeah. They had, was it Graham, the, the lead singer? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, Lou Graham. It was yeah. the original guy. So we, we, we went all the way across the world. I mean, we did Europe with them, and then we, and we came back here and finished a bunch of dates with them here in America in 1985. He's one of my all-time favorite rock singers. I mean, he's just There's so nobody that can touch him, man. Man, he's I mean, great. Well, hey, man, thank you so much for uh, coming in. It's great to see you again. And, it was so great to see you, Joe. And, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Good luck the on, on the tour and the new record. And, and maybe we'll get back to getting Buddy out there next Yeah, we'll <laughs> maybe we'll do Buddy, or maybe we'll find another demo award that might, needs to travel a little while. That's right, know? that's right. Thanks for watching me. This Thank is Hall of Fame backstage, and we'll see you next time.